Here is what you need to know to master transfusion medicine in clinical practice. Let's get started. Blood can be transfused either as whole blood or as individual blood components. Blood is made of plasma, RBCs, WBCs, and platelets. Plasma makes up about 55% of whole blood. It is acellular and contains water, electrolytes, proteins like clotting factors and albumin, hormones, waste products, and antibodies. RBCs comprise 40 to 45% of the whole blood, and WBC and platelets comprise the rest. Whole blood transfusion carries the risk of volume overload, immune reactions including GBHD and febrile reactions. In addition, whole blood has a much shorter shelf life and WBCs and platelets lose functions over time. For this reason, whole blood transfusion is rarely used nowadays. Instead, we transfuse the individual blood components. Indications for Act RBCs transfusions vary depending on the patient's conditions. In stable, non-bleeding, and asymptomatic patients, the criteria for transfusions are different from those in patients who are actively bleeding, hemodynamically unstable, or symptomatic. In the first group, transfusion is indicated when hemoglobin is below 7 grams per deciliter. Multiple clinical trials, including the relatively recent MIN trials, support this restrictive transfusion strategy even in acute MI. While in patients with active bleeding and or hemodynamic instability, RBC transfusion should continue until bleeding is controlled and hemodynamic stability is achieved, regardless of the hemoglobin level. Please do not be misled by the initial hemoglobin level in patients with active bleeding. This value is often falsely elevated due to hemoconcentration and only reflects the level at the time of the blood draw. The true hemoglobin is likely much lower. In hemodynamically unstable patients, blood can be transfused as quickly as possible, similar to an IV fluid bolus. Each backed RBC unit is about 300 ml and can be given over 20 to 30 minutes. Multiple units can be given simultaneously. In cases where volume overload is a concern, an IV loop diuretic may be administered during or immediately after the transfusion. In stable patients, the backed RBCs unit can be transfused over 4 hours in patients at risk of volume overload and over 2 to 4 hours in patients without that risk. Hemodialysis patients may receive the transfusion during hemodialysis in non-emergent situations. O negative blood is the fastest option in emergencies requiring bacteria blood cells. Immediately order O negative blood and request a type and cross match for the estimated number of units needed. A type and cross match differs from what we call type and screen. Type and cross match we determine the patient's ABO and RH blood type and test the patient's blood against specific donor units to ensure compatibility. While in type and screen we identify the patient ABO and RH blood type and screens the patient's serum to any clinically significant antibodies. Use type and cross when transfusion is highly likely or urgent and use type and screen when the transfusion is possible but not certain. Please wait at least at least 15 minutes after the transfusion is completed before drawing blood to repeat the HNH hemoglobin and hematocrit and this include all kind of transfusion. Before I continue if you would like to receive a summary of this video and access the previous video summaries kindly subscribe to my substack the link is provided below. Let's move to platelet transfusion. Platelet transfusion is indicated in the following situations. Actively bleeding patients if platelet count less than 100,000 in central nervous system bleeding or less than 50k for bleeding outside the CNS or before major surgeries if the platelet count less than 100,000 in CNS surgeries and less than 50k in other major surgeries outside the central nervous system. Also platelets indicated in disseminated intravascular coagulation DIC when the platelet count is less than 10,000 to minimize serious bleeding risk. Avoid platelet transfusion in conditions characterized by platelet destruction, such as immunothrombocytopenic purpura, ITP, or TTP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, hemolytic uremic syndrome, HUS, and HELP syndrome. Transfused platelets in such cases are often rapidly destroyed, providing limited benefit. However, in cases of significant or life-threatening bleeding, platelet transfusion may be considered
considered to help control the hemorrhage. Now platelets are either obtained from a single donor by a process known as apheresis or from whole blood pooled platelets or multiple donors. A single donor unit roughly equals 6 to 8 random donor platelets units and it is expected to raise the platelet count by 30,000. Single donor platelets are always preferred over pooled platelets as they carry less infection and alloimmunization risk. Unlike backed RBCs, platelets APO compatibility is preferred but not necessary. APO incompatible platelets can be used with minimal risk. However, major compatible platelet transfusion are associated with higher count increments. On a related note, RHD negative girls or women of childbearing age must receive prophylaxis with RH immunoglobulin if they receive platelets obtained from from RHD positive donors. Let's move to fresh frozen plasma or FFP. It's indicated in INR reversal and plasma exchange. Now, INR reversal is indicated in warfarin associated life threatening bleeding and before emergent or urgent procedures. Reversal is not indicated for suprotherapeutic INR without bleeding. Now, for warfarin associated life threatening bleeding like intracranial bleed, four factor PCC or prothrombin complex concentrate is the first line. It contains factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. Now, if this is not available, we can use combination of 3-factor prothrombin concentration complex and factor 7, as the 3-PCC lacks factor 7. FFP used when the prothrombin concentration complex solutions are not available. FFP has a greater impact on INR at higher INR levels. As INR approaches normal, each unit effect diminishes. This means it takes less FFP amount to reduce the INR from 6 to 5 for example than from 4 to 5. Each unit of FFP is 200 to 300 mL. Effective hemostasis generally requires coagulation factors at 25 to 30 percent of normal levels and fibronogen levels of at least 75 to 100 mg per deciliter. To achieve this about one quarter to one third of a patient's plasma volume may need to be replaced. Adult plasma volume is approximately 40 mil per kg. This means for a 70 kilo patient, 700 to 800 mil of FFP, which is roughly 3 to 4 units, is needed to achieve hemostasis. Each unit of FFP can be transfused roughly over 30 to 60 minutes. A slower rate or a loop diuretic can be considered if volume overload is a concern. The goal in most cases is to bring INR to equal or less than 1.5. Check the INR level 15 to 30 minutes after completion of the transfusion and repeat the infusion until INR is equal or less than 1.5. If it's still elevated, we can repeat the dose. The effect of FFP is typically lasts around 6 to 8 hours. Keep this in mind when using FFP to reverse INR prior to a procedure. FFP is not rich in fibronogen, but it can be processed in multiple ways to produce what we call cryoprecipitate, which is rich in fibronogen, factor 8, von Willebrand factor, and factor 13. Cryoprecipitate is usually given in pools. Each pool is made of 5 units or packed, and each unit is 10 to 20 mL only, which means it doesn't carry the risk of volume overload. Each pool is transfused typically over 30 minutes. Cryoprecipitate is mainly used in DIC patients who have serious bleeding or at high risk of bleeding, example after surgery, or require invasive procedures. In these cases, the amount and type of plasma product transfusion must be individualized. Some may decide to give FFP and some may decide to give FFP and cryo or cryo alone based of course on the PTT, active PTT and fibronogen levels. I prefer to follow this recommendation provided from up to date. If the plasma fibronogen is less than 100, we administer cryoprecipitate to increase it to above 100 mg per deciliter. On the other hand, if the plasma fibrinogen level is above 100 mg per deciliter and the PT and APTT remain significantly elevated, we administer FFP. Now, one unit of cryoprecipitate per 10 kg of body weight is often sufficient to raise fibronogen level by 50 to 70 mg per deciliter. For a 70 kilo patient with a fibronogen level of 50 mg per deciliter, we will need 7 units or packs of cryo to raise fibronogen level to above 100. Repeat labs 30 to 60 minutes after all the transfusions are finished, and based on the fibronogen level and PT and PTT, we decide whether to give fibronogen or FFP or both again. Mass Massive transfusion can lead to complications including dilutional coagulopathy, hypocalcemia due to citrate toxicity, 
hyperkalemia and hypothermia. To address this issue, massive transfusion protocols have been de developed. Now, massive transfusion is divided as the transfusion of 10 or more units of whole blood or packed RBCs within 24 hours, or three or more units of packed RBCs in one hour, or four or more blood components within 30 minutes. In practice, you don't need to strictly count units or track time. If you find yourself continuously administering blood products, initiate massive transfusion protocol. This is most often needed in cases of trauma, cardiac surgery, obstetric hemorrhage, and liver disease. In massive transfusion, we aim to follow one to one to one ratio one RBC unit, one platelet unit, and one FFP unit. Cryoprecipitate should be used if the fibrinogen level is less than 100. Calcium should be provided if there is symptomatic hypocalcemia. Let's move to transfusion reactions. Remember that the RBC, the packed RBCs and platelet units contain some WBC and some plasma. Plasma units, the FFP, are acellular. They don't contain cells. Transfusion reaction can occur with any type of blood products, not just the packed RBCs, and are categorized into immune and non-immune reaction. Immune reactions include the hemolytic reactions, febrile non-hemolytic reactions, allergic reactions, trialy transfusion related acute lung injury and GVHD graft versus host disease. Hemolytic reactions, although rare today, can still occur due to procedural errors from a major ABO incompatibility leading to the recipient's antibodies attacking the transfused red blood cells. Remember that strict ABO compatibility is required for RBC and FFP transfusions while it's preferred for platelets but not necessary. Hemolytic reactions are characterized by the development of fever, chills, back pain, chest pain, flank pain, pink or red urine or serum during transfusion or within 24 hours afterward. Stop transfusion immediately, perform a transfusion reaction panel and monitor the patient closely. The development of DIC and acute kidney injury support the diagnosis of acute hemolytic reaction. If confirmed, treatment is primarily supportive and the patient should be monitored in the ICU. Febrile non hemolytic reactions are caused by reactions to donor white blood cells or cytokines present in the transfused products. This reaction primarily occurs with RBCs and platelet transfusion and is rare with plasma transfusion as plasma, as we said, is a Cellular. To reduce the risk of febrile reaction, RBCs and platelets can undergo a process called leukocyte reduction, resulting in what we call leukocyte depleted RBCs or platelets. This reaction, the febrile non hemolytic reaction, is characterized by isolated fever above 38 degree or 100.4 Fahrenheit, chills or rigors during the transfusion or within four hours afterward. Of course, stop the transfusion immediately and perform a transfusion reaction panel. Acetaminophen can be administer to reduce the fever. If the transfusion reaction panel is negative and the fever resolves, the transfusion can be resumed with a new unit. Consider using leukocyte depleted units if available and discard the unit that led to the reaction. It's worth noting that there is no strong evidence to support premedication with acetaminophen or antihistamine. Allergic reactions may happen due to hypersensitivity to proteins in donor plasma. It is common with platelets and FFP transfusion due to plasma proteins but less with packed RBC transfusion. To reduce the risk of allergic reaction, the platelets and RBC can be washed from the plasma the so-called washed RBC or platelets. This reaction, the allergic reaction is characterized by pruritus, hives, or urticaria, or localized angioedema, but without wheezing, without shortness of breath, and without systemic angioedema, and of course, no hemodynamic instability. This reaction may occur during or at the end or shortly after the transfusion. Again, stop the transfusion completely and administer diphenhydramine. If symptoms persist, a second dose of diphenhydramine may be given. Once symptoms have resolved subsided, the transfusion may be resumed with the same unit as the remainder can be used safely, unlike the other type of transfusion reactions. Now, anaphylactic reactions may happen and typically occur within seconds to minutes of starting the transfusion with the rapid onset of shock, hypotension, angioedema, respiratory distress, and wheezing. 
Immediately stop the transfusion and administer epinephrine along with antihistamines and other supportive treatments as needed. It is essential to evaluate these patients for IgA deficiency as IgA deficient individuals may have antibodies that can trigger severe reactions. For the future transfusions, consider using IgA deficient blood products or washed red blood cells to minimize the risk of recurrence. Now, pre-medication with antihistamine and corticosteroids may also be considered, although its effectiveness varies. Trally, transfusion-related acute lung injury may happen due to donor antibodies reacting with the recipient's leukocytes, causing inflammation and capillary leak in the lungs. It is more likely to happen with the plasma-containing products, FFP, pla platelets, and to some extent cryo, due to the risk of donor antibodies against recipient leukocytosis. Now, TACO or transfusion-associated circulatory overload, on the other hand, is a non-immune reaction caused by fluid overload from the transfusion, resulting in pulmonary edema, especially in susceptible patients, particularly, again, with high-volume products like FFP. Now, both TRALI and TACO can present with similar symptoms, including shortness of breath, hypoxia, and bilateral infiltrate on the chest x-ray. However, TRALI tends to cause more severe hypoxia and respiratory distress. Stop transfusion immediately, administer IV loop diuretics, provide supplemental oxygen to correct hypoxia. Patient likely will require non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or mechanical ventilation. Now, if it's TACO to transfusion associated circulatory overload, the patient responds quickly to diuretics, while TRALI does not and requires supportive care similar to the ARDS treatment. Now, an individual with previous TRALI history of that can receive blood products from other donors without restrictions, but should not receive any remaining untransfused portion of the implicated product or any other products from the implicated donor, the same donor. GVHD or graft versus host disease transfusion reaction is rare and happens mainly in immunocompromised patients. When the donor lymphocytes identify the recipient's tissues as foreign and attack them, to reduce this risk, backed RBCs or platelets can be irradiated to destroy the donor WBC, including lymphocytes, before transfusion to immunocompromised patients. So to wrap up, we have leukocyte-reduced RBC or platelets used to reduce the risk of febrile non hemolytic transfusion reaction, washed RBC or platelets used to reduce the risk of allergic reactions, and we have the irradiated RBC or platelets used in immunocompromised patients to reduce the risk of GVHD. In the end, if you would like to receive a summary of this video, kindly subscribe to my Substack page. The link is provided below. If you find this video useful, please give it a like, share it with your colleagues, and subscribe to the channel if you have not done so. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.